Hey guys, how's everybody doing? Well, it is really windy outside. You hear it blowing or not, we've had the remnants of hurricane or tropical storm or tropical depression. Alberto de Mendia coming through southern middle Tennessee today. And so we're hearing that out there, but we're safely ensconced in the shop here with our 68 Plymouth Valiant and this is just going to be just a random assemblage of clips of anything of interest of putting this car back together. Brief history of this car is that I bought this car about a year ago and it was really solid and it was also really neglected. It ran but barely. It stopped and started and that's about it. So it needed attention all the way around but it's really original. It's had one paint job still got 13 inch wheels on it which are going to have to go away because you can't buy them those size tires anymore that are suitable for highway use but other than that it's a really decent old car and so the first thing it did of course is just tear it apart and then leave it for a while that's what all of us do seems like when we get into a project when it's kind of daunting i guess but anyway irregardless <laughs> What was going on was this uh, one thing that I had the wrong way that it really bothered me was that it had an exhaust manifold leak. Of course, there's no exhaust manifold on it now. I took all that off, took all the accessories off, painted everything. It's all on the floor over there. Ready to go back on. You got the upper manifold over there alongside that valve cover. And I think the exhaust part of it's here. And it had a common issue on this is what happened was that well, we can see or not, but this is a mating surface between the two manifolds. This is where the exhaust comes up and meets the bottom of the intake, and it's kind of eroded right here, pretty bad. Still got like a little tiny lip here, but that's that. So that needed to be rectified, and I tried a solution that did not work. I used a compound on it that flaked back off again, so we're going to have to get back into that. And then the worst part was that that inside bolt, you got three bolts, two go three right there, one right there. That one had snapped off, rod right away it snapped off. So the thing was leaking a whole ton of exhaust out right there, really loud. So I've already tapped that back again, drilled and tapped that manifold to fix that. And then it also had up here at the front, it's got to have one done. Oh, right there, where we at? Yeah, where am I? I think it's that one. Yeah, that one's gonna be put up probably put a helix coil in that one. So anyway, that's going on. At least it's in the front. So I've got a couple bolts broken in that, so I kind of just really don't like doing that kind of work. I kind of just pushed it off to the side and just kind of left it. So it's just been sitting here, it's just kind of neglected. And then I took everything apart out of the inside of it on the dash to kind of get it spruced up. Well, it still needs a lot of sprucing up, but you know, we had a weathered instrument cluster that didn't work all the way, and then the radio didn't work. The heater controls busted apart. I think the remains of that one are back here in the back. And the handle that was knob that was coming off in your hand and stuff. So, anyway, just a lot of little issues that needed to be tidied up. And so, that's what I'm doing. Get back into this, and we're getting ready to put the heater box back in. This is a heater box I restored last summer, so it's all ready to go back in. And it's really simple on these cars. Let me grab something to show you, though. No, it's really simple on these cars. If you ever take one of these in and out, if they don't have air conditioning, if they have air conditioning, it's a little bit more involved. But anyway, this thing just lives under the dash here on the right side and that's the hole where the blower motor sticks through to the outside and what holds it to the firewall are just those four or studs go through right there and then you can get a glance up here through the missing glove box and see what it looks like or here lines go through right there so I've got a seal that goes on the other side you'll see that in a second and the only thing to remember is one thing is that you have a ground for the blower motor that bolts over here. So you got this long line that comes over and you got a cable that runs it 
right here and it kind of goes across the top and lay across the top and all that but you can put that in after you get a chance to do that and the other thing is the most important gotcha on this and especially if you're taking one of these out now i've done a video on taking one of these heater boxes out already and I haven't looked at that video in a long time and I haven't had a comment on it in a long time so I don't know if anybody even looks at that. It was back kind of when I was doing videos that sort of <laughs> they're not quite as good as what I do now. They sort of jump in in the middle of things so I try to do more explanatory stuff. So one thing that I may or may not have co covered on that is that you're looking at the top of this heater box blower motor goes through the firewall these are your four uh, captive studs that mount through and they've got four coarse nuts that you put on over there i think they're seven sixteenths but the gotcha is that this thing is supported on this end this passenger end right here if you're looking from the seat area by this hanger like this now this is open there's an opening up there i should have showed you and i did not we'll take another peek in there but uh, this is open to the uh, plant the cow back here Which in other words is that area back over there where there's a vent so it draws in air for the heater Anyway, so this is a seal to this it has got a foam seal that goes around it, but when you put all this together You what you have to do this is a hanger that comes through and it hangs this thing up keeps it from pulling the Thing apart over here, but you've got a if you look down in there. You've got just a little hole right there and what you're going to do is you're going to position this here box in where it goes and maybe get the nut started loosely and then you're going to come back in with this thing and you're going to run it up and you're going to hang this hanger up on the lip I'm going to show you and then you bolt it in through that little hole down there and that gets it all in position so if you've got one of these darts violent darts whatever it's got this here box like this be sure be sure if you're taking the thing out that you Take this loose that you know about it because if you don't you're gonna rip the hell out of it and then you're gonna be mad probably mad at me because some random guy didn't tell you how to do this but anyway so it's not hard to do you just make sure you do it because you ruin your day if you don't I feel like this camera's getting foggy for some reason I think it is I need a new camera pretty bad. This one's pretty low tech and it focuses very slowly and it's just not too happy anymore. Okay, so what we're looking at is we're going to peek up in there. You see that? I didn't get the light over. You can see there it is. So this thing is going to go, if I can do it without blocking the light, I'm looking through the camera. It's going to hang over that wherever the appropriate area is for it to do it. You'll know it when you put the thing together. But just make sure you do that. So this is going back down through that heater box and bolts into the bottom. And the thing to remember also is that the heater box is made of fiberglass, some sort of fiberglass resin, I guess. And these things are not very durable. So try not to do anything to this to break it. So don't put force on it. So when you're taking them out, I'm going to say this one more time, and if you screw it up this time, it's on you. And when you take these out, you need to make sure you get that hanger loose and just wiggle this thing out gently. Don't be forcing on it, and don't be forcing it to go back in. So I warned you. All right, guys, so we're going to get the heater box in. I think that's going to be tonight's project, and yeah, I may possibly start on the rebuilding this. How many trips you want to take around this car? Why does this camera look so foggy? Somebody know? Anyway, I've got to rebuild this control head. This is actually not the one I'm going to use. This is the one that. I'll take one more trip around. The problem is I don't have any lights over here on this side, so. Said. I think I, I think I told this fascinating anecdote already. Whoops! Get out of there. But when I put these lights up, I had a car in there, so kind of messed my program up. So we're just freehanding it tonight, guys. We're just doing a walk around and 
hold the camera in my hand thing. So this is the heater control panel and it's got three cables coming out of it and a wiring connector for the fan switch. And what was wrong with this one is you see that there's a there's supposed to be two of those. Let me get it for you now. There's part of it. So anyway, it's supposed to be two of these things in there. And what happened was it goes like right and attaches to that. But you'll notice that slide thing here, that plastic piece with a pin through it is gone. It disintegrated because they're just old and plastic and all that. So this thing was free to just fall out and it didn't do any good. It didn't do any good anyway. It wouldn't slide. So it wasn't attached. And then on top of that, this plastic part here, which is supposed to bolt to this, front of this, is busted right there and it's busted right there. So had some problems. So I've got another one of these. I managed to find one of these on eBay. So I'm going to carefully uh, condition it, clean it, lube it up, put the cables on it, and paint everything and get it ready to put in. So anyway, hopefully it'll work right. And in the future, I'm going to be very careful with manipulating that thing. <laughs> So anyway, all right guys, so anyway, so anyway, so anyway. And what I like about this is I've got stuff I ordered off eBay like flashers and relays and some other stuff up in those boxes up there that I don't remember what any of it is, but I know it's here. So it's like Christmas again. It's been so long since I ordered it. Now I get to be surprised all over again. <laughs> Thanks for watching guys. And we will see you Maybe just in a minute. I think you will, actually. This camera sure is foggy. Well, I just spent 10 minutes looking for a plate that doesn't exist. Well, it does exist, but not how I thought it existed. So, I thought there was supposed to be another plate on this. Like a light-colored metal plate. There's not, that's it, it's still there. So I got the screw here someplace. Ah, don't worry about that, I'll find that in a minute. But anyway, that leads me to a question. Would you guys like to see a long skinny rod? <laughs> sure you would. Here we go. So this heater case is back in. And of course, as always, I can't see it, but there's the rod right there. See that? Admire it. So that's how it works. It goes in there and it's got the bolt comes up and I just screwed the screw back in until it's snug. I don't, man, I ain't taking any chances and ripping a hole in that thing. So that's it. How that goes and you got the, right, got the wiring back in, got the ground wire back on. And what I was going to say is that seal that sits in there that I just put on. Of course, it's a little too short. It doesn't fit exactly right. So I hope as this thing kind of settles, I'll go back in and maybe tighten that <laughs> rod some. And draw it up closer. All right then. So, good. I think that's going to be it for tonight. It's about 8 o'clock. It's about time for me to call it. So... I really enjoy working on these cars. They're so simple to work on. <sighs> so okay. I think tomorrow I will embark on this heater control and see if I can get the new one put together. And I guess I need to take the... Uh... Yeah, I was just looking to see how that goes. Yeah, that's going to have to go in... I don't know. I was going to say I had, that has to go in from the front, but I don't think so. It comes apart, so good. Good. That way I can take the, I can take the, uh, thinking out loud here. I believe I can take and just place the control assembly in where it needs to be and hook all that up. And in the meantime, I can be doing the aggravating task of masking this and 
painting it and all that because it's got to be I've seen these be silver and I've seen them be black but I'm going to go ahead and paint this one black to match this thing here so and that will thing there so that'd look kind of I don't know what do you think but that'd look kind of silly to have like, two black and silver and then have one just pure silver so that's what I'm going to do make a consecutive decision <laughs> executive decision I tell you I think my battery's run which ain't no big deal I like having to go buy another battery but I didn't have high hopes for that battery anyway because that's the battery that came out of that Plymouth out there that white one and when I went to test drive that Plymouth the very first time back last October before I bought it that battery was stone cold dead so batteries just don't like to be killed like that and so yeah I might be able to get it to come back but that looks like a that looks like a tractor battery pro power plus that looks like something goes in a tractor that's not even the one that goes in it so I'll probably go back down to rambling now but I'll probably go back down to the interstate battery store and get another one of those blims those 24 F or 24 R blim batteries whichever the one that goes in this because I've got one in that white Plymouth and I've got one in that green one out there and then one in the green one's three years old and is working fine so far so okay guys well that's gonna be about it for tonight I think I got out there just out of curiosity I keep thinking of things to tell you but hopefully you guys don't mind hearing me talk sometimes because I tell you things that are actually kind of interesting but when I was under that Plymouth the green one in here doing some work on it uh, I'm not about to get back in there and show you I forgot to do it but take my word for it when you're looking up from the bottom on the other side of there where the oil pump is you can look along the pan rail just above it and there's a little machine pad and if it's the original engine of a 69 up it's going to have the partial vent on it which that one did out there showed it to be the original engine I made a video about that by the way but my, that one out there says 3R126003 which matches the characters in the vent on that car so that's the original slant six in that green Plymouth that's never been out that I know of and never been re replaced or anything. So this one, we don't know about this one because I looked at that pad and that pad is blank, which signifies a 68 uh, or earlier slant six engine. Somebody looked on the, there's also a displacement pad over beside the, the coil bracket over there on the top of the block and it said 225. and somebody says oh that says it said something like R2225H or something and somebody says some source of knowledge said oh that's, that means that's a 73 uh, whatever I don't think so I think this car had at some point I think it had a either the original engine rebuilt or it had another one put in it but it's a 225 for sure so and like I said, this car had a one. This car was supposed to have a 170 slant six in it. That's what the VIN calls out, and that's just that's the carburetor it had on it. So who knows what happened? And I'm not going to worry further about it. Not worried a bit about it. Just something to be interested in, I guess. But and what's interesting also, while we're doing some more rambling about slant sixes, is you know I complained about that transmission in that green Plymouth that 73 because it's what's called a partial synchronized transmission and I got looking on the 73 option list like the uh, you know I was telling you back then or maybe I had mentioned this that uh, Mopar used to do this thing where they for whatever reason like if you got a three speed manual transmission in one of those cars you, you got like the base cars got a transmission that wasn't as good as the next one which means in in this case a 198 equipped Valiant got a partial synchronized transmission which is what that one had but that car doesn't have a 198 it has a 225 in it so a 225 equipped slant six with three speed on the column like that one should should be was was supposed to have a fully synchronized three speed transmission 
So it didn't have that. So I know the first thing people rip off and say, this, well, it doesn't have the original transmission in it. That's why. Ha <laughs> ha. I know that. Well, guess what? We were under that car many times, and also when I took it out, looked, verified it, but the transmissions on those all have a partial vent on them, just like the engine does. So when I took that transmission out, I looked at it carefully, and it had a partial vent on that partially synchronized 198 transmission that said it matched the car. So it was all original. It was not. So it was just one of these things that, you know, that's been... It's been shared, you know, around the Mopar community that just because Chrysler said that this car was going to get a 170, doesn't mean that's what it got when it rolled down the line. Just because that car out there was a 225 and it was supposed to get a three-speed fully synchronized transmission doesn't mean that's what it got. Because what happens is they don't do it anymore because things are too computerized and too closely monitored. But back in these days, when they built these cars, especially Mopar, Mopar was the worst about it. But uh, when this thing came, you know, you have to remember something is that when these cars come down the line, they were moving pretty quick and they had to stop at every station. You know, there's a guy that put interiors in, there's a guy put wiring in, there's guys that, put, that dropped the car down on the subframe with the engine and transmission, all that in it. Guy put rear ends in, guy put wheels on. So all these stations, this thing stopped at. And they had it planned out so that when the car came down the line, you know, it wasn't this big party going on where everybody's walking around just having a good time and then somebody'd get some time to well, okay, let's go put a let's go put uh some wheels on. They had the book. So, you know, they were they were pushing them to get these cars out because they sold so well that they were, you know, just barely keeping up, I guess. So anyway, when this particular car came rolling down the line, you had all these stations, what they call station. And if you work in a factory like I have in the past, you know what a station is. That means that something comes to your station and you have something that you put on or put in or install or do or whatever, and then it takes off. So when this thing came rolling down to the station, the station had, say, the engine station had all these engines lined up, right? So, you know, the guy's got the bill sheet at his station for this car it's supposed to spit it out when it got there and so he looks at the looks at the bill sheet and it says this thing's supposed to have a c engine in it which would be a slant a 225 instead of a a i think it was which was a 170. so he turns or you know he gets his crane or his hoist or whatever you know the doll it's got the, the subframe on it out here and he turns around to look and he's got oh this is a 225 this is a 225 this is 225. I don't have any 170s. What's what I have a 170 here? I don't have it for this car. Well, he is not going to stop this car for 15 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever the heck time it's going to take to get locate the correct 170 engine back here in this field of engines he's got behind him. He's not going to do that. He's going to grab the 225 that's sitting right there with the automatic transmission in it, and he's going to run that thing around, and he's going to stick it on the line, and they're going to drop the car, and the car's going to be gone. So that's how it happens. You know, that's the way that worked. So, you know, I wasn't there, but I mean, it's just common, you know, it's just common reasoning that's how it would happen because, you know, they're just not going to, they're not going to stop the line just to find a, a correct engine. When it's a slant six car, you get the slant six that they're available and put it in it and take off and the customer just got an upgrade. They don't know it, but that's why this thing could have theoretically could have been coded for, you know, um, a uh, you know a 170, but that's why it, it, didn't, it doesn't have one in now. But who knows? You know, it had the carburetor to it, but not the engine. Interesting. Now that's real quick. Let's just talk about that green car. How would that happen in that green plane with the 73? Well, same deal. When they come down, they had, you know, somewhere they probably had a snafu. That car was ordered. That lady or the man or the whoever. I assume it. That car had only been titled one time before. The guy I bought it from titled it, so you know it was a woman that owned it. So she ordered that car. It was already sold when they built it. So same deal happened. They come down the line, and you know that was a base car, and that car should have all all intents and purposes that car should have had a 198 slant six in it. So that's probably what they intended to do. You know maybe who knows, but somewhere I don't know, but somewhere they got screwed up. They probably weren't putting very many 
three speed on the column values together even back then that's probably not a common thing they were trying to sell them with automatics and v8s and stuff like that you know they sold a ton of these with automatics in them that that really was a rare car to have a three speed in it and you know maybe one day i'll kick myself for taking that thing out but it was just terrible to drive but you know that's the same thing that happened you know they come down and you know when the when that green bay arrived at the engine the powertrain station whatever you call it you know they're looking around back here and they're supposed to be the engine in line that's going to well you know he probably didn't even notice so maybe they did but he probably he probably says well you know this is the engine that goes in it but that's a, that's a three-speed transmission somebody just probably just grabbed the wrong transmission they probably thought well and stamped it they probably thought well nobody will ever know that is a, who cares she wants a three-speed on the column that's a three-speed on the column transmission put it in so that's how it worked that's why it got what it got you know and that's one of those things is you know it's fun to talk about it's fun to think about it's fun to theorize about but in in you know it drove terrible it was a bulky transmission it sucked that's the end result and she probably you know that lady she she may or may not have known that but um you know, she may or may not have known that they stuck her with the wrong transmission, which they did. So, anyway, guys, I got to wrap it up. I got to go in and get something to eat. So, we'll come back, hopefully, good Lord willing, we'll be back in Slant Sixville tomorrow again. See you then. All righty then. We're on to evening number two, as the case may be. And as promised, I'm working on this climate control panel for this Plymouth back here. And I had to get another one of these, as I mentioned earlier, because that the original one, or the one that was in it, broke. It's missing some parts, and yes, we got a thunderstorm going again. It just moved through. It was a pretty rough one, too. Anyway, if you look in here, as I've noted before, there's a couple slides, and they've got these plastic, well, there's, those are the slides, and if you look on this one that was in that car here, and it's all there except that it's missing, missing one of the slides and all that it's supposed to go right there i have it but it's in pieces so these things are fragile and they're not they don't to my knowledge i don't reproduce any of the parts for them because this is just a valiant it's not roadrunner it's not a takuda it's not all that that's so popular and yada yada so anyway be that as it may we have to make do so Part of that make and do is that, just looking at something there, it looks like I don't have my latch down all the way where I put my, did change my cables over. It works good, but in the interest of preserving this thing's lifespan and not having to go through all this again at some point, then I want to kind of brace these up. So, because if you look here, and I hope the camera, oops. We'll show this. I'm trying to look you through the viewfinder. But if you look right there where my fingertip is, you see where that roll pin goes through? Yeah, it's like I got a mouthful of food there. Where the roll pin goes through that plastic and through that metal bar right there, there's already a stress fracture on that. And that's where they break. They just separate right there. So I'm going to try to use our good old friend JB Weld. <laughs> <laughs> to try to use that I'm going to uh, try to preserve this thing as long as I can so I'm going to put a coating of that over these plastic bits and hopefully uh, give them some added strength and maybe it'll be years down the road before they'll break I don't know that but we'll try it and see and in the meantime I'll come over here to the parts painting area and I have my panel painted up, the first coat, coat, first shade of black on it. I didn't really say that right. I had the first couple of coats of black on it, so then I'm going to let that dry overnight, and then I'll peel that, and we'll uh, put the silver on it to trim it. Uh, this is, whoops, <laughs> this is Rust-Oleum paint for plastic. Uh, satin black and even though it's intended for bumpers and things like that it works very well on your vintage 50 year old climate control panel and that thing was actually silver with black writing on it and I, don't, I can't explain that why that would be like that but 
I don't like it, so I painted it black. <laughs> Manager's discretion, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, guys, right, I'm going to seat myself again at this and uh, get working on this further. Try to go ahead and get it in the car tonight. We'll see. Hope so. Stay tuned. Yuck! All right, so it's the next day, evening, and as promised, I have this climate panel back in. Get the light for you a little bit. It's not my best work on this paint, but it's just going to have to do for now. So anyway, it's back in. Everything's tight. Looks pretty good. Uh, but I ran into a little problem. Not nothing that's bad, bad. But if you look uh, back in there, at the wiring harness that comes from that plug plugs into the back of the fan switch, and then you see that wire right there. Let me get you. There we go. It's got two cracks in the insulation. It may not be all of them. There'll be more someplace else, but those are the two I can find. So that's not going to work. But what I will do is just go ahead and patch that with this stuff here. Sorry for the dark in here. It's just the way it is. Kind of inside the car and everything. I wish I knew. A way to get better lighting with things in here but anyway this is this liquid tape it's basically like sealer but it's like some kind of a this makes like it's called liquid electrical tape it's supposed to be but anyway so I just goober that stuff all over and let it uh, solidify and it's kind of makes a nice excuse me sort of flexible Sorry. Anyway, kind of a nice flexible sort of coating, protective insulation barrier, so or something like that. So there you go. See that? Well, we ought to smell this stuff. It smells real good. Ooh. So okay, that's gonna be. It's almost. Well, it's after ten tonight, so I'm gonna do this and sniff that stuff a little bit and then I guess I'll go in but uh, tomorrow's well I'm actually off tomorrow I worked ahead this week so I've got Friday off so one of the things I want to be sure to get done is get this radio put in and then we're gonna work on this cluster and that's got to wait till tomorrow anyway because Somebody forgot to buy the new headlight switch that's got to go in there. After I did all this testing on that last year, found out that one was bad. And then, it's not going to stop anything, but under here, you got a few things going on that are going to have to be corrected. You see that plug right there with the two ends chopped off of it? That was go to the radio. The yellow is the illumination and the red is the positive. 12 volts key on runs the radio and then down there you see there's another plug just kind of hanging out right there I don't know if I mentioned this or not but this car is old enough that it does not have the reverse light switch on the transmission like all the later ones it's got the old style which ended in 68 that's supposed to be one bolted on to that steering column right down there where that bolt hole is and it's got like a little thing that runs around and makes a contact when it's in reverse and that's what plugs into it right there well I don't have one and I haven't been able to find one because it only goes on a Plymouth or a Dart so uh, well yeah you know there's that's fun because down here they don't care if you have reverse lights or not but there are places in this country can you believe this that you get a ticket for backing out without illuminated reverse lights sad but true but not here so we'll deal with that when we need to deal with it but otherwise everything's looking good so I'm gonna do a couple things involving the radio installation and then we'll do that tomorrow so thanks for watching so far see you just a second or two okay then so 
I'm doing work as I can here, but uh, another evening I've got the radio in and hooked up and everything and all that. So um, what I'm going to do now is just some fun stuff because it's kind of late and I didn't have anything else to do. So I thought I would just work on these flashers a little bit. And uh, you got on these, is like most cars, you have a emergency flasher which lives in there. It's actually lit up there, the old one that's got a little bracket there that clips into the metal structure and then the turn signal flasher oh i've hit my head on that already be careful but lives right here under the dash it's got another one of those things on it so uh to make it if you it actually amplifies the noise of the blinker unit to have that clip to the dash it sounds maybe a little crazy but that's the way it works so with all this stuff over here i should have a couple replacement flashers i looked on ebay and found exactly the ones that go on it so the square one i show you is a signal stat 175 flasher and it would not work the original this one wouldn't work T427, that may be the original, maybe a date code. And that other one under there is just a generic flasher unit. So I wanted one that turns on flasher had that good ding, 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 ding. So let's look in here real quick and see if we can find what we're looking for. I know this is probably one of them. And then this one looks like it's empty. Not good. No, it's not empty. That's a dome lens. But where's the one that has what I want in there? This one. Nope. What's this one? Oh, it's my radiator cap. Nope, not that one. Not that one. I don't think it's that one. What's in here? Yep, that's it. Yeah. This is an original signal stat flasher. It's just like the one that you see there should be. The box and everything. 175. It's not a reproduction. It's a original real deal. There you go. Slight. That's it. That's that one. I should fix that up. And then this one. Because it's a tongue saw, heavy duty flasher. And it took a lot of research to find this out and I had to look at the other car out there to make sure I was right about this. But this is the original style flasher for it. It's blue plastic, but it's called a Hung saw 224. That's the one that goes under the dashboard. So put those in. And I wish I had the battery. I'm able to hook the battery up by testing it. The other thing to do is that I got this situation with these wipers going here. <laughs> and it's got these old naggly snaggly black crap plastic wipers on them so i just happen to have in my stash <clears throat> a couple pairs of the original style wipers for it that's not one of them that is one of them right there and that's the other one I believe it is yeah 
So we got those. <clears throat> and those will go on here like that. But we got to have refills for them. So I ordered some refills back last year. That's what's in here. Ten inch refills. Lane code, two dollars and thirty seven cents. There's no telling how old these are. A pylon made in the USA, not China. But these should go in here. Just fine. So we'll do that too. Alright guys, well we'll pick back up on this tomorrow at some point. And I was unsuccessful in finding a headlight switch for that uh, locally. So I had to, I'm had i going to have to stop and hustle tomorrow. I'm going down to see my brother. So I'll just pick one up there. They said they have one in stock. So I'll do that and we'll get that cluster back in and all that. And I think we're going to, that'll, that'll wrap the inside of this up, I believe. So then we'll come back and start back on this slant six. Okay, young people, listen up. This is what you did back in the day before these corporations trained everybody to think that your stupid car needed a 20 or $30 set of wiper blades. You simply had a metal wiper blade assembly. It was very well made, never wore out, never, no, nothing ever happened to it. You didn't replace this whole thing like this. Some people did later when not knowing any better because they're consumers, but anyway you look here this has got a wiper refill and they used to all have wiper refills and so this one's been in there a long time but you squeeze this and pull it Hang on. help me squeeze it and help me pull it yeah <laughs> anyway take something to squeeze this end here and then that helps you get the assembly started moving. I know what you're going to say. It's too hard. It's too hard. But it's not really, won't you? These been, no telling how long this has been since these been out. They're falling apart. But slide the thing out like that. Toss it. Take your replacement. These are the same on both ends, so I don't think it matters which way these go back in, but you just take your replacement and start threading it back in. Make sure you get all the little holders around the channel there. Come up here. Sometimes it may be a little tight, but you can always maneuver them a little bit more than one way or the other. Yeah, that one's all right. That's all right. Fit in the last one, and then you come back to here. Actually, about messed up there. You got to squeeze this. Make sure the retainer goes past that. Yeah, that's why. They, that's why they don't do them. It took too much. It took too much thought and too much effort on people's parts to do this. I guess. So there you go. You got a wiper refill installed. 
And that's what you did back in the day. You can still find these pretty easy. People on eBay sell them. These are these nice ones that they flex. This is made by Trico. And go, excuse me. And some of these things you look on eBay, they go for big bucks because it's oh, these are original red button and go wiper arms. Wiper arms or wiper arms or wiper wiper blades, I guess you'd say these are not the arms. Alright guys, well I'm gonna do the other one and put these on and we'll go forward. So one thing you'll find yourself needing to do periodically on these slant sixes is you'll have to replace the spark plug tube seals and uh on these older heads up to about, I think they changed them for model year 75 or so, they have these, what's with this camera again? They have these, uh, it's called spark plug tubes, where the spark plugs go, and they look like this. When you take the plug out, you have this little stamped piece of metal here, and the plug goes down in there keeps this thing in place and then right here you have a seal that just slides up there and by the time you get to them in 30 years 40 years 50 years whatever it is normal that they are sort of petrified so you probably can take this one and squeeze it and it'll crack apart yeah so there you go. They can't seal very good when they're that tough. So I've got a new set. You can get these. I think I ordered these. Felpro makes these. Part number ES12794. And you get a collection of six of them. And you can see they're nice and pliable. So that's all you do. You just make it, slide it back down on the spark plug tube seal. So, and then you put your plug back in. If you're changing plugs, go ahead and change the plugs. But these look pretty good. They're a little bit. You guys running rich. Wasn't running exactly right, but I think they'll be okay because they're not worn or anything. So I'm just going to make sure the gap's good on them and put them back in. I'm going to take these. Oh, these, uh washers off here just so to do that I'll take those all off i have them out and then put the plugs back in those are autolite 66s and i bought a set of ngk uh 2635s for it but it, like i said it's not going to need it so i'll just keep those in reserve and sometimes if i ever need them i got them all right so you do spark plug steels okay guys well i think i'm going to wrap this segment up here and so i thought i would just go ahead and give you a little look at how things are coming along on this and uh, show you where we're at so got the interior done and put back together as you saw so it's all back where it was everything's back in should be working good i've tested the electrical everything seems to be fine with that so that's very good so i got back under here to the engine and started working on this putting it all back together after I painted it and so kind of can show you where we're at with it. I think it turned out really good. I like doing this kind of work. It just takes a lot of masking things like that so what I've got left to do is kind of I recently took all this apart because I had a manifold issue I told you about that so those pieces are over there in the floor and I'm gonna work on those fish putting them repairing them and then get them ready to put back on and then also I've got to put a stud back in over here that broke <clears throat> and actually been broken for quite a long time so that and I got a couple braces I want to go ahead and paint up under there in the motor mount so 
I gotta do that now. I can't put anything else on here till then. But got all the hoses on except the upper. Still gotta put the radiator in, of course. I fought with those spring clamps, which I really like those. They're good for keeping constant tension on your hoses, but they are a bear to get on there. So I'm gonna take this oil cap and do something to it because it's supposed to have um not sure what I'm gonna do actually. Yeah I do know. Actually I do know. Um I think I'm gonna put some good quality steel wool down in there because you can't really see it. But that thing is supposed to have some kind of metallic wool. They call it wool, but it's like it's coarse steel wool. It's like a filter medium. And the idea is that you oil that, clean it and oil it periodically. And that's so that, because that's normally connected to the air cleaner, it draws in air that is not filtered, and it has to be filtered here so you don't get dirt down in the crankcase. And then this is the early PCV system. And then it comes out this metered orifice back there that is not a PCV valve on these. Not, well, it is, but it isn't. It kind of is, I guess. It's whatever you want it to be, really. I guess you say it is. But then that goes back to the carburetor. So that's how that works. So anyway, I have to do that to that so that I don't suck dirt down in the engine. And so I'm going to put all the rest of it back together. And it should be ready to crank up and run. So I just wanted to also while I was making this little clip, I wanted to kind of talk about why I do this. And it's, well, a couple reasons. One of them is I just enjoy detailing things like this and making things look good. And the second is, is I feel like that uh, things like this add uh, beauty and value to a car. And you may say, well, you know, you've got this kind of all original looking car with you know it's not that shiny or anything like that but you, know, you got this shiny engine in here well that's that's true I do and it may stand out but I've in the times I've done this I've never had anybody complain about it they never said well, boy that engine sure looks too it looks too good compared to the rest of the car when you're a car person or a car guy you really love engines and uh, a clean engine and a detailed engine makes a lot of good impressions on people, I feel like. And, you know, I've seen people's cars that look really good and they you look under the hood and they've got a nice clean engine, but it's an engine that's kind of rusty, kind of got a lot of flaking paint and stuff like that going on, even though the rest of the car or the truck may be really nice and shiny. You know, you kind of look at this engine, you're kind of underwhelmed with it. You think, well, you know, if you put this effort into the rest of it, why didn't you try to get the engine compartment shaped up? And I guess there's a couple schools of thought on that. Some people think that, you know, patina or original engines like that should stay that way, and I do sometimes, but I feel like there is definitely a delineation between old original that's in good condition and old original that don't look too good. It's got rust and flaky paint and missing paint and things like that. You know, and it, it, when it comes down to it, you know, at the end of the day, these the items and the work that's needed to do something like this, to make an engine look good, to detail it, even with it still in the car, it's not really that much. You know, it takes a lot of masking. You gotta take the thing partially apart to do it the right way. You know, take the pulleys off, take the take the uh, carburetor off, you know, wires and things like that. But even for one of these Mopars, even for like a Slant 6 like this, the, the parts needed to do stuff like this, like the paint and the clamps and the hoses and the detail things like, for instance, how many of you see these? This is one of the factory here hose clamps. It keeps the heater hose in place and it's got a bracket right on there. I, don't, I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody either not use that bracket or it's zip tied to it. I'm going to tell you something, there weren't zip ties back when this car was built, so there's no need for them to be on here. 
in my opinion. And so, you know, you it's not it's not expensive to do it, and I feel like that it adds a lot of value, and especially if you have a nicer, you know, a car or truck or whatever it is you're working on that's already really 95% there. You know, why why stop right there? You know, you're not going to have somebody, you, you just aren't going to have somebody say, well, that engine just looks too good. They're going to open the hood and they're going to say, wow, that engine looks good. You know, it looks like you it looks like exactly what it is like you spent your time and effort and a little bit of money on the engine i can't i can't tell you how many times i've seen that i see cars on ebay that the car they spent all this money on paint and interior and wheels and then you get to the under the hood area and there's like a missing battery hole down which i have one the air cleaner's wrong they got all these worm drive clamps all over every place you know, that's not painted, it's not detailed, and you're thinking, yeah, you know. Like, I can tell you on this this engine, one thing I don't like about this is that it has the wrong alternator on it. It has a square back alternator. It is not supposed to have one for this year of a car. And that's unfortunate, but there's only one I have with a single groove pulley because these stupid alternators, you have to disassemble them totally to change the pulleys on them. I'm just not going to do that. So I'm going to use that one. And the wires aren't correct. They're not the original Mopar type wires, but they're they're close enough. And I'll get another. I'll get a you know original style filter for it with original spring clamps that go on there. And the only thing I'm probably not going to do on this one is I'm probably not going to put a. I've got a couple original battery cables. One of them's over there, but I don't think that's the one to this car. I don't know where the one to this one's at, but. Uh, regardless. Uh, it's got some clamped on ends on it which looks scuzzy on any car but uh, I don't know what that is heard something sound like coyotes last night anyway uh, I'm gonna reuse that because the one for this car is like a couple hundred bucks and that's like out of the budget right now so uh, like one thing here we got an air cleaner that I have restored with the correct kind of crackle paint on it but I still have to order the sticker that goes on it but I saved my original every one of these air cleaners came with a uh, maintenance sticker it's got a part number somewhere on it let me look here it's yeah 2205176 I think that is 5376 rather excuse my thumb but <clears throat> anyway they sell these all over the place they're easy to find they're cheap it goes right on there of course I put my carburetor back together with its original most of its original uh, date tag stamp thing and then I got my original hose here I don't know I don't think this yeah I guess it is this has got a little bit of a red stripe still on it uh, that goes between the air cleaner and that breather I just showed you So the reason I think that's original is because that back in the day that there weren't special hoses for that. They just took a length of here hose and used that. So that one's got remains of a red stripe, so it's probably original. It's original enough for me. So I got my radiator over here and I have a radiator cap. That is a fair enough reproduction, I guess. A new cap that's been kind of printed with some other stuff to make it look original, I guess. But yeah, it's close enough. But it'll do for the for a driver quality. It'll do fine. Yeah, that's not that's my dash hoses. Yeah, that's not the one that goes on this one. I, I don't think I have to look at that. It might be, but I don't think. Hmm. Could, something to look into. All right, guys. Well, I'm gonna quit rambling and just put all this together and upload it for you. It's been a little while since I made a video, so anyway, yeah. So just wrapping in this thought up here. You know, this, this stuff doesn't take. It's not hard to do, and it doesn't. It doesn't. You know, doesn't cost much. It just takes some detail, and so something to consider if you got a real nice old vehicle 
you know, don't don't leave a ratty engine in it. It's just my personal opinion. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll pick back up on this sometime soon. See ya.